Guys, we have been in the book of Mark, and we're just going to backtrack just a bit. The Lord laid it upon my heart to go back just a few verses. We're still in Mark 9. And, and, and address this, uh, read through this uh, piece of scripture. When I was in school, uh, a long, long time ago, when I was in school, especially in elementary school, when we went anywhere in the school building, from our classroom, we got in a line. Y'all remember that? You, you went to our class, you got in line to go to our class. Went to lunch, you got in line to go to lunch. You was always in line. And it was always a really big deal to be first in line. Y'all remember that? A lot of you, uh, a lot of our teachers and whatnot, uh, they even had systems. So, so the same person wasn't first in line every week. Now I completely get why it was a big deal to be first in line at lunch, right? Because I still want to be first in line at lunch. Amen? You ever been last in line at a church potluck? And I'll like say, I don't know, Shirley's meatballs are gone or something. And you're like, oh my gosh, Christmas is ruined. <laughs> I get that. But a lot of times, what was really the point? I don't know what we were trying to do, like get to the other classroom first. Who cares? I mean, they're not starting, so we're all there and sat down. Right? But we wanted to be first in line. That was, that was important to us. Um, and we wanted to be recognized. We want to be the leader, if you will. Being leader is cool. Being leader is important. <sighs> Tell me if you picked up on this. Maybe it's just me. Have you noticed an uh, attitude of entitlement in our culture? Is it just me? Like pe people want to be first to the line. People want to be first. People want to leave. People want to do this and that. But yeah, they feel like they're entitled to it without earning it or something like that. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that has noticed this. Let me tell you a time when I, in my life, wanted to be a leader when I wanted to be first. Uh, I was working at a manufactured home, a uh, manufactured housing company. And, and we, I was on the salesman there. And there were a few of us salesmen and the general manager. And uh, the lot also was struggling. And I'm not going to get into the details, but I think some leadership mistakes were made, uh, this and that. And we were really struggling there. And I remember the regional manager, by the way, I was 23, by the way, okay? Uh, youngest guy in sat by home. Uh, the regional manager comes in, we have a little powwow, and I said, you know, Mr. Earl, can I speak to you privately? And he's like, yeah, Josh, you know, what do you need? And he said, I said, man, you know, you know, when are you going to give me a shot to, to be the manager here? I mean, I, you know, he, he knew when I came in, I was hoping one day be a manager uh, in, in the company, you know, what about, what about me? You know, what, when's my turn going to come? And he looked at me and said, I need to hear it. He said, Josh, I, I, I hear there's a lot of problems here at this lot. I know you've got concerns about inventory. I know you've got concerns about it. And, and you're right about a lot of these concerns. But Josh, you're going to start selling some houses, bud. You're going to start selling some houses. And he's right. I mean, yeah, I did have a lot of excuses. And that's what they were. You know, we don't have the right inventory. We don't have any four bedrooms. We don't have this and that. Or blah 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 blah. Electric blah. I had a lot. We had a lot of concerns, and I had a lot of excuses. And that's what they were. They were excuses. I heard him, and so so I took it upon myself to, to, to help the new general manager and to and to get the you know get the pricing right. Let's let's work on mentor. Let's do that. Let, and, I, and help serve the rest of the team. That's not my heart at first. I was like, no, give me the rock. Give me the ball, man. Give me the ball. I'll, I'll, I'll get us home. I'll take care of it, you know. Josh, you got to start selling some houses. So, so I went to serving. I went to serving instead. That, that, that young 23-year-old wanted to be put in charge without serving first. You got to serve first. Uh, Jesus here... Uh, is hanging out with his disciples and they're, they're, they're cruising, they're on a little trip here. And you're not going to believe this, but his disciples started arguing about which of them was more important, which of them is 
next in line, which of them is Jesus' right hand man, who's the greatest. Who's the greatest, if you will. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? Oh man, can you imagine Jesus asking you that? He knows what you're discussing, you're not real proud of it. You know what I mean? You ever ask your kids, you, you hear, you're here talking? What are y'all talking about? Nothing. Because they've been talking about anything good. Right? If you ask them, what are y'all talking about? Nothing. We're talking about anything. You know, darn well, they were talking about something. If darn well, something you don't want to, that you're not going to be happy to hear. Am I wrong? Teachers, am I wrong? Parents, am I wrong? What were you guys discussing down the road? But they didn't answer. Because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Was the greatest. Specifically, they were talking about who's going to be the leader. Who's going to be in charge. He sat down, called the twelve disciples over to him and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place. And be the servant of everyone else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my father who sent me. It's pretty powerful in there, right? It's kind of odd. Like, first of all, they're arguing up here about who's the greatest. He tells them if they want to be first, they better be last. And then he starts talking about little kids and and welcoming them. Like, what, what's the connection here, Jesus? Like, what? Why did you follow that up with talking about little kids? So we're going to talk about that more that this morning. Is that cool? All right. So, last week we talked about hermeneutics and exegesis. Hermeneutics are, are a set of laws and, and a set of rules that, that we uh, apply when we study the scriptures. And what we want to do to the uh, scriptures is what we call exegesis. It's pulling meaning out. Pulling meaning out of the scriptures that we can apply to our lives. And if we look at her hermeneutics, we realize that context matters. How things are said, when they're said, to whom they're said, historically, culturally, grammatically. So we're going to do that this morning as we look at this scripture. I hope you understand it. Some of these nerdy things that we talk about sometimes, hermeneutics, exegesis, they matter. And they're applicable to, to, to our lives today. So we're going to do that as we look at this scripture. So, a word here that sticks out to me is this. So, first of all, first of all, he tells me, whoever wants to be first must be last. So then he starts talking about little kids. And then he says we need to welcome a little child like this. Welcome. Let, let, let's look at our hermeneutics. We're gonna look at the grammatics here. What does welcome mean? Like, when we say welcome in America today, sometimes that can not have much weight, right? Like, hey, welcome. Whatever. Right here, whatever. Welcome. Right? I loved, I saw this on Facebook just the other day. It was on somebody's door. Welcome, it Depends on who you are and how long you're saying. <laughs> right? <laughs> I so badly want this in my house. <laughs> Any introverts out here really feel this strong? Like, I, I love company. I do. I enjoy having folks over. But as an introvert, it just poo, sucks energy out of you. And that's good. That's a good place to send energy. But, you know, it depends on who you are and how long you're saying. I love this sign. I was on a kid looking at signs like this. So I found this one, too. Please leave by nine. <laughs> right, I so badly want to hang out at the party and stuff. Please leave by nine. Like, I love you until 9 o'clock. 9.15, I'm ready. You know, you're not my friend anymore. 9.30, I'm going to escort you out, you know. <laughs> 9.45, I'm going to spend. <laughs> and you can, yeah, I want to hang this up. Welcome. What's welcome really mean? Because have you ever been told uh, welcome to somewhere and you didn't really think that meant it? Oh, Andy, Welcome. You ever, you ever felt like that before? I mean, you, you've been so sorry before, right? And you know they didn't mean it. Any of that? Some of y'all don't know how to apologize yet. 
I think I've done one good thing in my life as a parent. I'm talking about kids. I apologize. They know not to give me that. I'm sorry. I said it. Moron. That's not, that's, that don't count. You know, you're not sorry. Sometimes you're going to say, welcome and not me. So what, what is this word here? Welcome. Well, let's, let's, let's apply these, these laws of our books. What is this actual word? And I'm going to butcher this, okay? So if you're a Greek scholar, forgive me. Dokmia. Uh, uh, also means receive. We're not just there, you know, saying, welcome, whatever. It's receiving, taking care of. Like, like you, you, you've experienced that welcome, and then you forgot about it. You've also experienced that welcome. Welcome to my house. Can I take your coat? You have practical needs. I want to, you know. The restroom's over here. Would you like, would you like a coffee? You know. Uh, we're going to eat dinner in here, but the hors d'oeuvres are set up in here, so feel free to have to help yourself. Is there anything that, you know. One, one of the things that I'm not mad at anybody. One of the things I, that I, I'm really frustrated with is, is we can't do welcoming here like we used to do. Right? Because you have to keep tongue distance. We don't know how to do that. We used to be all up in your face when we came here. I was still involved, right? I walk them. What's your name? Where do you live? Can I come to your house? <laughs> that truthfully happens to them. But, but there's, it's receiving. It's just not saying it. It's just not, you know, welcome. It's, it's actually receiving people. Making them feel welcome. Taking care of their needs. Giving them, giving them space. Serving them. Can I take your cup? Do you have food to eat? And I also don't mean a little, a little, you know, function or something. But are you taken care of? Do you have shelter this evening? I welcome you. I'm receiving you. Do you need companionship? Do you need friendship? Do you need prayer? What is it that you need? I'm here to serve you. I'm here to welcome you. I'm inviting you in. I'm going to share with you. Deeper word we're using here. Well, all right, now, so fine. We need, we need to do that to, I don't know, hit the wrong button. We need to do that to little kids. Fine. So I guess what this means here is that we need to invest a lot of money in children's ministry. We've done it. A lot of our, a lot of our space here is dedicated uh, to children's stuff. Is that what it means? It says here, clearly. They put a little child on them, taking the child's arm, and said, anyone who wants a little child like this on my behalf. So I guess that's what it means. We need, to, we need to just focus on the kids. We need to build, build great children's ministries. Well, yeah, we, we do need to have good children's ministries. I don't think that's what he's saying here. So, let's go with grammatics again. What does a uh, little child, what word is that? Uh, once again, Greek scholars, I apologize. Um, grammatically, it means little child. <laughs> Didn't help us much there, did it, guys? That's what it means. Little child. That's all I got to say for you about that. Well, okay. So, pedian means, that's the Greek word, pedian. Fit means little child. Well, you know, what else are we doing here? Because this is kind of a weird, you know, you got your disciples arguing. Want to be leaders, want to be most important. And then he starts talking about children's ministries. Like, oh, we're all for children's ministries. What the heck's I got to do? You got, you got your, lead, your boys over here arguing about who's the most important. Seems like it's time for another lesson. What is he talking about? Let's look at culturally. Let's look at historical context of what's going on here. Now, when we think of little kids in America today, we love them, don't we? They're precious. Absolutely precious. Amen? And we spoil them, and they get way too much junk at Christmas, and we spend so much, and especially with the little ones. They, you know, stumbling around and don't even know it's Christmas and don't know who the Santa Claus figure is. They're scared of him, right? I love it. I hear love at Christmas time. The pictures of the kids freaking out on Santa Claus's lap. But we give them all these gifts because they're so precious and they're innocent. Innocent? Okay. <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. Another sermon for another day. But they're precious and we love them. We'll do anything for them. We spoil them. And it's okay to spoil them. And we buy them all kinds of of, uh, especially these little ones, but all kinds of uh, toys spend upwards of who knows how much money, and at the end of it, they don't care about the toys, they put it in the box, right? Spoil many halves of precious. 
kind of, kind of different sense of feel about kids back in the day when this was written. We look at the historical context, the culture of the time. These are people that, that are much more hand to mouth. They got a lot of extra money to spoil the kids. I mean, they love the kids. Don't get me wrong. Don't, be talk, don't hear me say that I hate kids, but it's another mouth to feed. They can't even do anything for us. Like they eat, sleep, and poop, right? They, 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 they're not even, this, this one's so low, I can't even help the farm anymore. I gotta get out to the orchard, the, the vineyard. What, what, I, got, I got work to do. I got, I got you know, carpentry work to do, whatever it is. And they can't help. They're a distraction. And actually, it takes other people's time and resources to, to take care of them. So this culture, and by the way, I'm telling you, they love kids, but, but, but they probably weren't getting spoiled at Christmas. If you know what I'm saying. They're, not, they're, they're, they're on the pecking order of people in the world. Kids were down here. Not as important. Not as valued in some ways. Because little kids can't do anything to help you. Little bitty ones. If you give them all kinds of stuff, they can't repay you. So what's Jesus saying here? They put a little child in them. Somebody's not important. Taking the child in his arms, he says, if anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf receives me, blesses me, loves me, welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my father who's sitting. We'll get to that next. You see this a lot in Jesus' ministry. Hey, keep the kids away from Jesus. Keep, keep the kids away from Jesus. You know, only four people on the Jesus like, no, no, bring those kids up here. Yeah. The drunks, the outcasts, the, the kids, people who aren't important. Yeah, bring them to me. The gluttons, the tax collectors. The people who are not important in the society, bring them to me. I want them close. Bring them in close. He says, receive those people. Receive people who, who can't necessarily repay you, who can't, who can't serve you back immediately. We, we've all done favors in life, right? Hey, if you, I mean, a big part of your marriage is probably, <laughs> like, look, if you take the kids to practice, I'll pick them up. Deal? Right? And sometimes, we, I mean, sometimes just, just to work out the, the plan of the day, how, sometimes a little bit of that's needed, right? I mean, I, I Sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, by the way, I think everybody, when they go to work, when you go to work tomorrow, you're going to work with the expectation that they're going to pay you in return. Amen? Some of y'all don't say anything. You, you should come work for me. Yeah. Well, sometimes favors are good, but Jesus is saying we need to serve people without being expected to be served in return. People like little kids who aren't valued in our society. We need to, to do that. People who can't pay you back. So you guys, if, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be in charge, one of the first things you should start thinking about here is if you want to be first, you take last place. You serve other people. You start serving people. If you want to do that. And by the way, being a leader is not as cracked up as not as cracked up to be as what I'm not saying that right. Good thing I don't speak for a living. It's not cracked up as to what it's no, like. You know what I mean. It's not everything that's cracked up to be. Thank you, Gator. <laughs> No, I think you're a true leader. Sometimes people aren't happy with you, are they? If you're a true leader, almost always somebody's unhappy with you. That's just a reality uh, of your life if, if you're going to be a leader. Sometimes I, as, I, as I talk to, to young ministers, who, who, young pastors who, wanna, who, who are people pleasers, who want to please everybody, one of my best pieces of advice is someone will always be upset with you. If you're in administration of your company at your school, somebody's always going to think you made a bad decision. People are all, you know, it's not always what it's cracked up to be. I'll never forget um, 
right out of high school. So, I, so at, at uh, my church growing up, uh, we always went to church camp. And it was a lot of fun. It was very meaningful to me as a student uh, in our ministry. I was a Hosville Baptist in my, my high school years. And uh, I was very close. And he spoke here to my youth minister, Chris Storch. And we would always go to the camps. And I had so much fun. And I was one of those kids that as soon as I was no longer a student, I said, can I help? Can I be a counselor in the youth ministry? Yes, you can be. So the next summer, I'm going back to, to church camp as a counselor. And guess what? That was a lot of fun, too. And I enjoyed it. I got to pour into the kids. And, and uh, you know, I know Chris did stuff, but whatever. And, you know, I got to enjoy Mr. the kids and lead them to the Lord and talk to them and talk to them. It was just great, good, fun. And I love church camp. And then I became a youth minister. And I will never forget my first year being the guy in charge of the youth ministry when we were at camp. Camp for the fun anymore. Some of these volunteers were crazy. <laughs> The biggest talking to that I had to give was not to a student, it was to a volunteer. Like, we might have to send you home if you say that again. It's like you can't, you can't, you can't tell that to the kids. All the stuff that Chris had to deal with in the past that I, you know, because he was the guy in charge. Now I had to. And it just said people were gonna complain, well, I don't get I want that room and I want that room and the, the bus breaks down, you gotta take care of it, and blah blah blah. Ugh. Church camp wasn't that much fun anymore when you're the leader of church camp. I'll never forget I got home and I said, Chris, I, first I didn't realize what had just happened. You know, I said, Chris, I, I'm starting to think that you know, being the guy in charge of church camp is not as fun as just being one of the volunteers. He just laughed. <laughs> He's probably still laughing about that. Yeah. Uh, one time I remember talking to, to Pat. Uh, about farming, just farm, farming life and the business of farming is not something I can talk to him about. So I don't anything about it, so I can learn new things. And I remember one time he was telling me it was a lot easier when I just was a farm hand, if you will. When I was just one of the guys that, that I wasn't in charge, I was one of the guys just helping. It was just easier. Let them stay awake at night. You know, let them take care of stuff. Being a leader is not always as fun as it looks because it involves a lot of being last and a lot of serving. That's what Christ calls us to do as leaders. Um, being a leader takes a lot of responsibility, a lot of commitment. And it's just not a title. It's just not a title. It, I find it fascinating a lot of times people get a title placed upon them. And then I think they're, they're a leader. Because if you didn't see, oh, this is a name badge, by the way. If you haven't seen, I got a title next to my name. So now I am a leader. And that's not how that works. If you ever want to know who a leader is in anything, just to look to see if other people are following them. Good or bad, that's your leader. I don't care if they have a title or not. In a lot of organizations, you'll find the true leaders don't have a title. I found a lot of times a lot of leaders just want to keep titles off of me. You know, well, everybody's following you. Those, those, those are leaders. Leaders serve. Leaders are committed. They take on responsibility. And often you'll find, I mean, good or bad, the leader is whoever other people are following, good, good or bad. But it's often the case that, that you'll find the leader is someone who is serving, who is welcoming people, who is receiving people. Let me give you an example. I think I've given this example before, but it's a good one. So we're going to give it again. So there was this church. I don't know the church, but there was this little old lady who was getting up her years. And I think she had the junior high, maybe the junior high girls Sunday school class. No, it was, it was just a junior high Sunday school class. It doesn't matter. I don't know why I'm even talking about it anymore. She had a junior high Sunday school class. She had been there for a long time. And the folks of the church decided, or somebody in the church decided, you know what we need? We really need somebody younger in there. She's getting old. Probably can't relate to the kids. She has a full class, but she probably can't relate to the kids. So, you know, they got some young, 20 nothing, you know, hip, cool guy to, to be, or maybe the gal, I forget. But the young, hip, cool person to, we're not going to tell her that her class is canceled, but we're going to let her have, we're going to give the kids another option, and then whenever the kids just leave her class, then she'll know, and we'll send her out gracefully and this and that. So the new person came in. And, you know, 
And they were ready for all the kids to go to the third class, but the kids stayed in the old ladies' class first week, and then the second week. And, the, the, and what's going on here? So they went to the kids, like, kids, um, why are you staying in the old ladies' class? Why aren't you going to the young person's class? You know that's an option? Yeah, we know that's an option. Why do you stay? She comes to my recitals. She loves me. She cares for me. She's received me. She tries to catch at least one ball game a year. She's welcome. I don't care about the young kid, whatever. I want somebody who cares about me. Somebody loves me. Somebody's received me. Somebody looks out for, looks out for me. Who I know cares. That's what's important to us. She kept on going for a good while. It was a really neat story. But Josh, look, I don't want to lead. You're right. Like, sometimes being a leader is a burden. And I don't want to lead. So, save this story for somebody else. Because it don't apply to me because I'm not a leader. Well, let me point something out to you. He calls us all to do this. Jesus was getting on his guys here, saying, if you all want to be leaders, step one is to be a servant. Step one is to take last place, because all Christians are called to that. If you want to be a leader, there are more requirements of you. In, this, in the Bible, we find, we find an entire list. If you want to do this, here's a list of requirements and, and responsibilities. He's just saying, baseline. Don't even come to me acting like you're important or you want to be a leader when you're not doing the simple thing I've called all Christians to do. So he's called us all to this. He's called us all to receive. He's called us all to welcome people. He's called us all to, to uh, love people and receive them and welcome them without expecting a favor in return. Without expecting a favor in return. In return. That can be hard, right? But that means I'm giving and I don't necessarily know they're going to you know, give it back. I, I, I hear you. I'm not telling you to be walked on or abused. But the scripture here is teaching us to give without expecting a favor in return. What else does it say here? It says, anyone who looks for a child like this on my behalf. Another way to say that is in my name. In the name of Jesus. Anyone who welcomes a little child like this in my name, on my behalf, welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. It's not about us. That's what he's trying to tell these guys. Look, man, if you want to be, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to lead, you've got to serve. And you need to not point people towards yourself, but point people towards me. I've seen too many times in my life within the Christian Church of America, uh, within the American Christian Church, a pastor have some kind of moral failure or a pastor go away or a pastor whatever or some kind of leader and, and everybody else's faith drops with them. We're gone too. Sometimes we make too much out of people on the stage. Sometimes we make too much of, of ourselves. What we're supposed to be doing is pointing people towards Christ and welcome them, welcome them, receive them in the name of of Jesus. Guys, one of the things I've, I've come to realize is people want to be welcomed and received just as they are. Like, that's a major need in our, in our culture. People just want to be welcomed and received. They want to belong. They want to have community. They want to be welcomed and received. They want to know their, their love. Um, oh, and, and I mean actual deep, meaningful relationships. Well, I actually... People have time for me. Not, not just. We're, we're developing this culture where you know we measure how much we're liked, loved, and received, and welcomed by how many likes we have on Facebook. You know what I mean? We don't even know some of those people that are liking our stuff, or, or those people who are liking. We don't even know them. 
People want to belong and whom be welcome and want to be received. Uh, one time I had a, uh, uh, another youth minister, um, I was talking to him and in his youth group, before the, before the function began, he heard his, his regular youth group kids making fun of somebody at school. Now, I don't know what, why they're making fun of this kid at school. He wasn't cool. He wasn't whatever. And he came down on a floor. I think he actually picked up a chair and threw it. <laughs> Not at anybody. Or he slammed him up, boom, slammed it down. He said, you're a bunch of spoiled, white, rich, southern kids, church kids. That kid you're making for, let's call him Johnny. Johnny would love to be here tonight. But y'all are too good to invite him, aren't you? Johnny needs somebody. He needs to be received. He needs to be welcomed. And this youth group who, has a, who, who could just invite him and he would gladly come, they weren't doing that. I am so glad that adults are not like kids, right? That's what we tell the chief. Right? I am so glad there are people, there are girls at, at work who don't get, that, that they get invited. I'm not saying that correctly. I know that there are most likely in your workplace, in your organizations, people who don't get invited to Mexican on Thursdays. Right? I'm sure that, that, that there are people uh, in your uh, club organizations who, who get left out sometimes, aren't there? I saw a statistic, a statistic a while back, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I kind of think it might be. You know what the number one reason why people don't come to church is? Why they don't initially come to church? They've never been asked. Studies show that a significant amount of people would attend a church if they were asked. They've come at least once. They're not asked. I'm so glad adults are not like kids. People also often ask, you know, how did y'all grow out there in Branchville? And I don't want to be hateful sometimes. It's just like, when we ask, <laughs> we ask. They want to, we ask our friends if they want to come. I'm going to write a book about it. <laughs> Pastor Josh Harris, how to grow a church. Ask people if they would like to come. How to get them to stay is a different conversation for another day. People want to belong. People, people need other people. People need community. I'll never forget this. I was, I've told this story before too, but it's, it's, it's very impactful for me in my life. Um, I had just started attending Hallsville Baptist Church's youth group ministry as a, as a teenager. Any of the driver's license, driver's license yet? I'm a Tell City kid, and a lot of those kids were Hallsville, uh, Hancock County high school kids. So, I, you know, there wasn't much of us in Tell City. And I didn't know if I was like, do I really fit in with these guys? Are they really my friends? You know, I don't know. Will they accept me? Do they, I don't know. Do they really receive me as one of their own? One night, we uh, one day, it was one of those days where their school system had the day off for the kids, and Tell City was still in school. So, uh, so the kids all, I don't know, they went to McDonald's. All of, all the Hancock County youth group kids went to McDonald's for lunch and this and that, and good for them. At the end of the school day, I came across the intercom. Josh Harris, please report to the office. All right. I don't know what this could be, you know. I get to the office. And those dorky morons left me a happy meal. <laughs> it was already cold and stale. Actually, that stuff never rots. Probably that stuff five years from now never rots. I don't know how. But I did. They left me a happy meal. I mean, a junior in high school has a happy meal waiting for him. A little toy and everything. <laughs> that meant so much to me. They had received me. They had welcomed me. Even though Josh couldn't hang out with them today on a little trip to, to Hallsville, those guys remember Josh and they brought, and they let me know it. I was received, I was welcomed. And I knew it. And that changed a lot of things. I knew I was one of them. 
I knew I was welcome in. I can guarantee you that right now there are folks who would love to watch a ball game in your garage. I can guarantee you uh, there are girls who would like to go eat Mexican with you uh, over lunch from work. I can guarantee you there are more slaves around the world like we uh, we spent a lot of money, $6,000 a bus, a few months back, to set slaves free on another continent. We're not expecting anything in return, and we're not. There's more of those folks. I am guarantee you there are more ramps to be built for folks with MS, folks with other issues, right in our community. Both locally, regionally, at work, around the world, there are people that need to be welcomed and received, and Jesus is calling us to be those people, to welcome and receive. So my, my, my challenge for you this week, I gave this challenge to my, to my small group kids this morning. We can list a whole lot of people, right? We can just go down the list of, you know, oh, this person needs to be welcomed and received, this person does, this person does. I want to narrow it down to even one person. Tonight, as you lay your head in your pillow or put the kids to bed or whatever that time is where you have like five minutes of silence with the Lord, reach out to them and pray to them like, Lord, press upon my heart that one person in my world who I need to welcome and receive, who I need to, who I need to low, uh, show them the love of Christ, who I need to put first and make myself last, who I need to serve. That one person, Lord, press that upon my heart. And it might be as simple as inviting them out to lunch. It might be as simple as sitting with them at the school lunch for your kids. It might be bigger than that. But ask the Lord to, to show you who that is in your life. And then actually follow through with it. Reach out to them. I'm not saying you have to be the everybody's friend. You've heard me say that. Like, you only have... So much energy and emotional. You don't have to be everybody's friend. You can't, you can't be best friends with everybody. But there's, who can, who's the Lord pointing you to to serve right now, this week? Then follow through. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being a God who put yourself last upon the cross. We thank you for being a God who serves us. We thank you for being a God who loves us. Press upon our heart what it looks like, what it means for us to actually serve folks, to actually love folks, to welcome them, to receive them. Folks who aren't like us, folks who we don't expect anything in return from. Help us to be more like you. I pray we all sit seek our own hearts tonight and ask ourselves who that one person is God. Holy Spirit, please move within our community. Move within our own lives. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen.